when you're upset with your health insurance, when it doesn't seem to be meeting your needs and in fact isn't meeting your needs, is it really your fault? That seems to be the thinking behind a whole lot of health policy in this country and only in this country as far as I can tell. And here to talk about health policy in this country is uh, Natalie Schur. Natalie is a writer and researcher. She is also a story producer for the television program Adam Ruins Everything on True TV. And she has an article in the new uh, edition of uh, Jacobin Magazine, and Jacobin, by the way, that mag is, that edition is called The Health of Nations. A lot of things in there well worth reading, including Natalie's piece entitled Model Consumers. So first of all, Natalie, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you for having me. And secondly, so are we just bad consumers in this country? Is that, is that why healthcare here kind of stinks? No, uh, despite what a lot of the logic behind health policy in the United States would have you believe, uh, the secret to building a coherent, cohesive health system that works for everybody uh, is not uh, changing individual behaviors like so many aspects of the laws have tried to do. Uh, it's coming up with a way to extend universality to everybody uh, that allows them to get care free from the point of service. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's interesting how much this logic is embedded in our policy-making class uh, of, uh, of thinkers. I, I recently debated a uh, leading Democratic economist on, um, on Medicare for All. It wasn't the, ostensibly what the panel was about, but it's wound up, that's what it wound up being. And I remember him saying every health solution that we come up with this country is going to have selection problems and I said not Medicare for all because the word all implies everybody's in but selection adverse selection is one of those ideas uh, that seems to be built into it that you have to design very complex programs so that free market principles of choice and informed decision making are going to come up with the optimum outcome but you know the two things about that one it seems like an inherently conservative way of thinking that markets are the solution and two so i'm surprised so many democrats uh, uh who aren't supposed to be conservative embrace it and two it leads to awfully complicated fragile uh, attempts at solving the problem uh, do, you, do you get what i'm driving at i think you do right absolutely uh, i think that the process that you're describing probably started sometime around the 1970s when there's this neoliberal revolution in healthcare, and patients start to be seen as consumers. Uh, you have a lot of different businesses competing for their time, and you also have uh, this desire to reduce healthcare costs by making them better shoppers. Uh, and so that logic takes hold anywhere from you know, the idea behind the individual mandate uh, that we can encourage people to responsibly and wisely buy an insurance plan by threatening them with a tax penalty if they don't. Uh, everything to, you know, the idea that certain workplaces have health programs uh, that they can put employees through that will be tethered to premium prices so that if employees want uh, lower priced premiums, they have to go through, um, you know, fitness tests, online courses, anything along those lines. Uh, all the way to the fact that there is a lot of cost sharing, like co-pays and deductibles, that are supposed to provide the right incentives for people to use less care than they perhaps otherwise would. Uh, baked into the idea behind all of these is a logic that the real problem with the healthcare system is that many, many millions of individuals in this case are behaving badly and that we need to think of policy solutions to encourage them to be better. Uh, and also the idea that these behaviors uh, are inherently going to be better than just leaving people to their own devices to get care when they decide that they need it because people aren't smart enough or uh, good enough to make those decisions on their own. And I think that both of those ideas uh, are really toxic and we ought to be pushing back against them very hard. Well, and this is where you get into uh, debates with people 
uh, on the liberal side of the spectrum who insist that, among other things, that this is absolutely the best way to go, and secondly, that the American people won't, uh, won't stand for anything more comprehensive. And we could talk about all of those things. I really liked what you did in this piece, Natalie Schur, uh, going through the history of, um, of how we got to this point and the thinking in, in the 1970s and all of that. And what it made me think of was uh, uh, back around that time, I would say, there was also a study by the Rand Corporation, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it was in the 1980s, that seemed to suggest that uh, if you add it, you talk a lot about how deductibles came to be and what their purpose was, and they're, they're kind of a social engineering tool to change behavior. Uh, of course, it also saves money for insurance companies. Um, but the uh, Rand Corporation seemed to conclude that if you increase the out-of-pocket costs to people for their health care, they would stop consuming, quote-unquote, uh, unnecessary care, but they would continue to consume necessary care. So it was basically affirming every bias that they brought to this. That study has since been, to my mind, fairly conclusively uh, challenged, and why not? It doesn't make sense. OECD studies show that uh, many Americans report that they defer needed care because of the cost, so none of it seems to make any sense. Uh, but it almost seems to be like an article of faith in certain policy making and political circles that no amount of information will shake. Am, am I being unfair? Uh, no, I don't think that you're being unfair at all. Certainly, uh, the RAND study is uh, still very often cited and is, you know, this keystone of uh, many policy wonks understanding of the healthcare system and how it works. Uh, I would argue that a lot of the interpretations of the RAND study in popular culture are incorrect. Uh, for example, among lower income people, uh, in terms of cost sharing co-pays in particular, uh, it was shown that there wasn't necessarily a delineation between necessary and unnecessary care, uh, that poor people used less care when there are co-pays and that their health outcomes suffered as a result. Uh, so, you know, the idea that the RAND study showed that there's no problem with any of this, ergo, let's, you know, engineer the most neoliberal health plans possible, I would argue that that is, uh, I mean, approaching a very bad faith interpretation of what that data showed in the first place. Uh, and you are right that I think that we have many, many reasons to disbelieve these things. You know, the idea that a copay isn't enough to, you know, the, the, the purpose of a copay, the reason that it exists, and it wouldn't make any sense to have them if it didn't, is to make people use less care. Uh, and that's because, you know, the idea is that this will make people think twice. And I think it doesn't take a detective to figure out the fact that what that really means is that you are going to scrape off the people for whom, you know, a $50 copay is a problem, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I keep emphasizing this point because it surprises me that people don't bring it up more. There is not an epidemic of rich people seeing their doctor every single time they have the sniffles. Uh, that's not the way it works. That's not how people think about their time. Uh, that's not how people think about how they want to spend their day. It's not a recreational activity for the vast majority of Americans. And, you know, the fact that that isn't happening in upper incomes where, you know, money isn't an object, uh, really, I think, should make people rethink what these copays are actually there to do and what effect they're having. And the effect they're having is to ration care among people uh, that might not have $50 to spare. Uh, and that that's, you know, a, a moral dilemma that people aren't being very serious about. You know, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm going to add that, you know, in your piece, you mentioned a phrase that, look, I think of myself as a dispassionate, uh, trained analyst in the field of economics. And I, I try to approach every argument rash, rationally. But if someone else in my presence uses unironically, the phrase skin in the game, I swear <laughs> to God I'm going to hurt somebody. I just am. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mention it, you know, that uh, 
first of all, uh, uh, let's talk about the two phrases you mentioned in the same paragraph. Uh, one is, you mentioned the Obama phrase, to bend the cost curve. Now, mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a second, because this was the mantra of the Affordable Care Act. We were going to bend the cost curve. Now, I'm not, I think I know what that means, okay? I, I, I think it means the cost curve for health care has been going up very steeply, uh, more certainly uh, much more steeply than general inflation, and that there, that curve was going to be bent so that it was somehow uh, 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 ascending more gently, I guess. Is, isn't that what mm -hmm. they mean by that? So it's not, we, you're not getting the rapid lift off of, of uh, you know, the, the, the three Gs of a F-16, you're getting more of a gentle loft like, a, like an airliner, but it's already really expensive for people to get health care in this country. So I've never Absolutely. understood the allure of the phrase to take something that's wildly expensive and it's only going to become mildly more expensive with each passing year when you already can't afford it. Is there a different meaning to bend the cost curve that I don't know about? No, uh, I mean, I think that you're right. I think that that's a way that economists think about uh, for the past several decades, um, costs in health care have gone up uh, at a far greater rate than inflation overall. Uh, and so it gets more and more expensive, but also more and more expensive in proportion to the money that people have to spend on it. Uh, and so, you know, that the way that that's plotted out in a graph bending the cost curve is just, you know, reducing the rate of acceleration. But that's definitely not something that speaks to uh, a typical person's experience with the healthcare system or how they think about the role that it plays in their lives. And so it's alienating in that sense. Uh, I also think that the idea of bending the cost curve through individual behaviors, as I mentioned in the piece, seriously misdiagnoses why this is happening. Uh, we don't have massive rampant inflation in healthcare well beyond people's ability to pay for it because each of them as individuals is doing a really crappy job of interacting with the healthcare system. Uh, there's no data to support that. That's an extraordinarily condescending way to think about people and patients. Uh, and I think it's a really toxic interpretation of what is driving costs in healthcare and what we can or should do about them. Yeah, and I have to tell you also on a personal level, Natalie, that I had um, I had surgery uh, this um, this uh, past month and. Uh, you know, being out of work for a week, when I get paid for the amount of work I do, I'm not on salary or tenured anywhere, that's plenty of skin in the game, thank you very much, to miss a, a week's worth of work. Uh, and, and a lot of Americans are in the same position, worse off. So the notion that you need skin in the game by uh, some economic engineer manipulating and making things more expensive for you, it, it, it also... Uh, distresses me, shall we say? And mm -hmm. and by the way, I'd like your thoughts on this. As long as we're at it, my own surgery, I couldn't find out. You know, they say be a smart shopper. I couldn't find out what it was going to cost me. Uh, I couldn't get opaque. my pardon. It's completely opaque. It's, it's totally very, very opaque. difficult for healthcare reporters to figure these things out. There are investigations right. going on at several different outlets of them trying to you know, untangle these complicated threads on uh, health care bills, and they're really difficult. And I haven't even received a bill, I, much less for someone to tell me in advance that to use this doctor in this hospital, which is participating in that. Re nobody could answer any of those questions for me. A month later, I still don't know what I'm going to be billed. Finally, on the insurance company website, it's been updated to say that I've met $3,641 of my annual deductible of 5000 So I guess it's going to cost me $3,641, but no one has actually taken the trouble to inform me yet. So what am I doing wrong that I'm not a model consumer? <laughs> uh, I mean, you're not, you're not doing anything wrong. That, I think, is a pretty uh, coherent illustration of a lot of these problems, is that, you know, even if someone was able to call around and get these cost estimates, if they're in that position, uh, a lot of the billing professionals at hospitals or providers aren't necessarily in a position to answer those questions all the time. Uh, networks change, uh, billing codes change, 
Um, in a lot of cases, you know, people show up for a surgery thinking that it's in network, but they've, you know, outsourced the anesthesiology and the right. anesthesiologist's fee is as a result out of network. And I think that the latest research I read on it was something along the lines of 22% of people get surprise bills uh, that are out of network when they expected them to be in network. Uh, and so, you know, it's really hard to make the point that these people who made these appointments in good faith, who thought they were staying in network, making these cost conscious decisions, get slapped with something that they didn't even know about. Uh, that is not, you know, a consumer education issue. That is a supply side issue. That is a systemic issue. Uh, that is an issue uh, emblematic of the fact that we have built a completely patchwork healthcare system that doesn't coordinate, that doesn't have enough cohesion, uh, and that doesn't have a mission to extend care to all people who need it free from the point of service. Uh, those are the problems. Uh, that's why you can't figure out what you owe and to whom. Well, this sounds like a, a, a situation that calls for incremental change, wouldn't you say? Um, that, of course, is a joke. Uh, we got about a minute left, Natalie. Uh, what is the solution? Well, uh, I am a really passionate advocate for single-payer system, uh, Medicare for all, as it's being increasingly built in the United States. And as I keep emphasizing, uh, that means that everyone is included, no one's out, one public unified insurance pool uh, that does provide service free from the point, uh, provide care free from the point of service. Uh, anytime you try to do cost sharing or uh, ask for even a copay at the doctor's office, you're disproportionately harming people who are sick because they're the ones who use care. So you're charging based on health status or you're dissuading people who are poor uh, or cash strapped from receiving care that they need. Uh, and that shouldn't be a financial decision. That should be a health decision to be made with uh, patients and their physicians and not with people and their personal bank accounts. Um, well, and so I think Medicare for all is really the only solution uh, for us in the United States right now. Well said, I absolutely agree. And I'm not talking about Medicare E or Medicare Extra or Medicare Lite. <laughs> I'm talking about Medicare Classic for all. Mm -hmm. And well, I, Medicare Classic with improvements. Uh, Medicare like Classic Plus for all. Medicare Classic yeah. Plus. Uh, all right. And with that, we will have to uh, come to an end. But as always, Natalie Shore, uh, writer and researcher and story producer, uh, great to read you and great talking with you. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much, RJ. I appreciate it.